Okay, are you seeing my screen? Uh, yes. And um, okay, so let me introduce. Um, so the third speaker is uh, Ginny Lau from uh, Ohio State University, and uh, she will be talking about non-trivial band topology, gate, tunable transport, and supercurrent. Okay, uh, please begin. Uh, yeah, so thank you for the introduction. And I want to, uh, thanks for coming to my talk. And I also want to thank uh, basically Bing and Fan has uh, put in all the effort in making this work up. Um, so I have already learned a lot uh, during the past uh, uh, two days. Uh, uh, well, they, um, okay, so to, I'm going to tell you about, uh, so this is a brief outline. I'm going to tell you about uh, two projects. Uh, so the first is uh, gate tunable transport in its core side 1D topological insulator business for IO bench. Uh, and then I'm going to, since I this is more time than usual, than the usual uh, talk at the workshop, so I also tell you about the uh, work, uh, recent work in superconductivity in a flat band, which enabled by topology and quantum geometry. Okay, so the first, uh, the first, uh, um, uh, so the, for the first uh, topic, uh, so this uh, this project is uh, basically a collaboration of uh, uh, you know with uh, <clears throat> all the fantastic collaborators. Uh, so the crystals are grown by Bean uh, at Dallas, and of course the theory was uh, in first first predicted, and now it's uh, uh, by Fan Zhang. And uh, uh, so Ming Yi and, and Bob Berginal has been doing the artist measurement. So what we do is a transport measurement. And so this work was led by my, uh, it's a formal student, Yilu Liu, and also my formal postdoc, uh, Luo Yu Cheng. Okay, so I probably don't need to go over this. I think you have already heard a lot of uh, really nice talks uh, yesterday and today uh, about this Cosi 1D topological insulators. And also, I probably don't need to go through this. A distant file die, we know they have consists of chains uh, aligned to a D direction. Uh, in particular, there are two different phases so, alpha phase and the beta phase. So, beta phase is a high temperature phase, alpha phase is a low temperature phase. Um, so the beta phase has been predicted uh, by fans group and also verified by the number of upper studies uh, to be a weak TI, where alpha phase has, uh, um, so this is a natural phase at low temperature. And this has long, will start to be trivial insulators. Um, and of course you heard uh, yesterday that uh, they have a recent theoretical prediction uh, in particular, for example, from fans group uh, they can host high order topological hinge state, and so these these are some of the um, uh, some some of the uh, so sketches of the hinge state and uh, that uh, <clears throat> that you can host uh, depending on the terminations of the top and bottom layer. <clears throat> uh, so far, so lot, most of the uh, so work are done uh, so a lot of uh, arbitrary measurement, and you also we have also. Uh, uh, so seen the studies, for example, uh, from Professor Yao uh, on the on the transport studies. As I would say, so far, uh, the mass majority, if not all, of the studies were done on the box samples. Uh, so here, what well, well, so we are a two D materials group. So what we do, <clears throat> whenever we see a layer material, we just want the thing done and make it into thin flakes. Uh, so we exploited this uh, nice bulk crystals group that being uh, being group, and we exploited thin films into thin films. So they're actually really not that uh, thin uh, when it comes to two D materials. They, so uh, <clears throat> so the samples we make are between twenty to forty nanometers thick, and since this material is uh, sensitive, uh, is uh, sensitive to air, we encapsulate them with uh, hexagonal boron nitride. And the exfoliation, I should say, the exfoliation and capsulation were done in a uh, in the inner atmosphere in a glass box. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so then we cool the sample down in a cryostat. So we did not do anything special like quenching. We did not quench it. Uh, so this, so this, <coughs> it goes adiabatically cool down in the cryostat. So they should remain in the this uh, alpha phase. Okay, so then we uh, do this uh, normal thing we do as a transport. So this is, for example, a, a picture of uh, uh, of the device we make. 
this is, uh, for example, this, uh, the long section is along the, this is the B direction. And uh, so we can make, so some, sometimes we can get this kind of uh, uh, flakes that are large enough to allow us to put Halbar geometry on them. So we can measure RXX uh, longitudinal and also the transverse resistance. So here we're plotting the top graph plots of uh, transverse resistance um, oops, as a, okay, let me see my laser pointer. Okay, uh, as a function of uh, uh, the gate voltage. So applying a back gate. And uh, so this uh, right, uh, right curve is the transverse uh, resistance. Uh, sorry, this is the longitudinal resistance. So this actually, where you, you can see there is a peak at about, uh, uh, this is min about minus 40, uh, uh, minus 38, I think, um, by gate voltage. And this actually looks a little bit like, uh, for example, what we might, we might see in the monolayer by the graphene. And, uh, as, and so there's a resistance peak and then resistance decreases as you go, as you increase uh, uh, resistance from uh, away from this peak. Um, and, and, the, and now the, the blue curve is the uh, trans hall resistance. And so this is, I think, taken at, um, um, maybe, I think maybe a Tesla, uh, or maybe half a Tesla. But the important thing is that you see that changes sign. Okay, so, and, and um, so, so this is, uh, so both of these actually shows, uh, suggests that there is a either direct point or a very, very small gap. Right, so this time, this measurement is done at 1.5 Kelvin. So the gap has to be very small, so it's, uh, smaller than, for example, uh, 0.2 millimetre load. Uh, to for us to see this, uh, uh, to this, this, this behavior. Okay, so uh, and then this uh, the bottom graph it just show, shows that uh, uh, the uh, the trans the hall resistance as a function of a magnetic field, and so we can see that all the graph is uh, linear. It shows this is pretty normal. Uh, so it's linear with magnetic field. This is what we expect to uh, to see from a uh, just from an field effect transistor, and and uh, so the different curves got be, uh, uh, are taken at different backgate voltages. And so this is a highly electron doped. Uh, this red curve is highly electron doped, and the blue curve here is high, is is whole doped. Okay, so uh, so this shows that uh, okay, so for the changing sign of the Hall resistance showing that uh, the dominant carrier changes from poles to electrons. Um, but we also we know that uh, if we want to put in the numbers, uh, the um, uh, the this the Hall resistance is not just simply given by you know, what we take from the true model of a single carrier, that like one over the charge density. Uh, so, it, it, well, so we can also estimate the charge density was induced by that, for example, the capacitance of the, <coughs> uh, of the, uh, of, from the back gate voltage. So that we show that it's not really just simply given by that. Okay, so to see this, uh, um, uh, uh, so to investigate the transport some more, we're now we're taking that this is longitudinal resistance uh, as function of temperature, and the red curve shows the hall resistance as function of temperature. So the hall resistance taken at one tesla is longitudinal resistance we're taking at zero a zero magnetic field. Okay, so and the, here are the different graphs corresponding to uh, different curves corresponding to uh, different gate voltages. Uh, so, for example, in the graph on the left, uh, so this uh, the red right one are taken close to the peak, uh, this so-called the direct peak, or you can say the gap uh, close to the peak of the resistance of the uh, of the gate voltage, and the blue graph is when it's highly hot dot. So, you just look at this, we see that uh, so the near the resistance peak, this is basically insulating light, the resistance increases as the temperature decreases. And when it's highly hot doped, uh, it's mostly uh, electron, uh, it's mostly metallic. So the resistance decrease as temperatures decrease. Although there is actually, it looks like for OK voltages, there's a small uptick at, uh, uh, at, at low temperature. Uh, <clears throat> and then when, yeah, if we, okay, so we will look at the resistance in the, uh, sorry, the lock hall resistance function temperature. Now what we see is that again, uh, so, uh, we change the sign as the different gate voltages. Uh, so these are all uh, fairly normal. But when we, we look at this graph, what it tells us is that uh, there are actually two competing channels. 
so one is a whole doped bulk state, which is insulator like, and then we have a gate turnable metallic channel. And so what we uh, here, what we can uh, do is, uh, uh, okay, so I should also just mention that these graphs are uh, uh, just data and they're not offset. Okay, so they, these are not offset. So there's, uh, um, so there's no vertical offset in the graph. Uh, so here we can try to collapse the data a little bit. We can try to just extract uh, what the Mitali channel do is that we can, for example, we can subtract uh, this, uh, this uh, now we're changing to this is conduct, uh, conductivity. So we invert this to change the conductivity. We can subtract the conductance from uh, taking one gate voltage uh, from another, okay? So what we're assuming is that if the conductance consists of two parallel channels, one is this gate turnable channel, uh, okay? So it's temperature dependent and also gate dependent. And we have a bulk channel, which is only temperature dependent and does not depend on the gate. So if we have, I take two of this, uh, if we had taken this conductance at two different gate voltages and we subtract them, so we can subtract out this uh, uh, bulk state. And then what we can uh, left is only the gate turnable channel. Um, and then we can normalize it by the difference in the gate voltage. And then we can assume some capacitance coupling. So this, should give this, so this formula here should give us the mobility of this uh, gate tunable channel. Okay, so this is what we do. This is what we did for, I think, the three or four different pairs uh, of, uh, of this gate voltages. We can see that they actually collapse pretty well into, uh, uh, into uh, a single graph. There is a little bit of scatter, but you know, compared to uh, this, right? So it's a, it actually does collapse pretty well into a single graph and uh, so, uh, showing that uh, at low temperature, uh, okay, so we have a mobility of about 800. And, uh, 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 and so mobi the mobility actually increases with decreasing uh, uh, temperature. Okay, and then it actually has a, a, a power law of d to the power 1.5. So this is uh, consistent with phonon limited scattering uh, for, uh, for, uh, at higher temperature. Okay, so uh, all right. So now I just say our experimental observation. So what we have seen is that we have some gate tunable tra transport channel in this alpha distance iodine. So uh, at least one of this channel is, is so this channel is, uh, is metallic and, and bipolar, and therefore hosting either a direct point or a very, very small, a tiny band gap. Okay, so now the question is, what is the origin of this uh, gate tunable channel? Uh, so let's, we need to first uh, exclude the mundane. Uh, uh, the main mechanisms. For example, it may be a kind of bulk band, but the density in the surface layers can be, uh, can be tunable by gate, or maybe it can be surface state on the AB surface. Although I think this is unlikely since we, from our uh, previous talks yesterday, we know there is a, really there should be a relatively large gap of the surface state on the AB surface. Um, but okay, so but we still maybe want to just uh, double, uh, check this with transport machine. Okay, so uh, and, uh, oh, I should say that the previous device, uh, so the one that we have seen the gate turnable behavior is have a, a side view like this, this is a side profile. So this is our flake, and then we deposit uh, device, uh, we deposit, um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, we deposit the, the contacts like this. So the contacts are contacting both the top and the side. Okay, so now I, to, for control measurement, what we did is we made the device, this is control device. So that what we did is we, we kept it with uh, HBN, but in, in this case, we, we make a hole in the HBN. Okay, so then, so that uh, uh, then we can deposit contacts, so which is only contacting the interior, of, we call it a bulk of the flake. Okay, so in this device, now, uh, so we're plotting this uh, conductance as a function of uh, this top gate. Actually, also, we can also see the back because, uh, we, uh, because it's, we're only contacting a top surface, so it, it, we plot it as a function of top gate, and also magnetic field. We just see that there is absolutely no, uh, nothing happened whatsoever. Okay, so now we can say that, uh, okay, the gate tunnel be Turnable behavior we have seen in a previous sample uh, is, uh, is uh, you know, that's, it's not coming from the bulk band 
uh, the sum of the service state on this AB or AB plane. Okay, so what are the possible, um, uh, so what are the possible, uh, um, uh, other possible mechanisms? So these are the, so they actually turns out to be three possible uh, uh, origin of this uh, gate tunable state. Uh, so for example, it's possible to have a size of the state of the BC plane as again, as we've seen uh, from the upper data yesterday. So these are anisotropy with Rashva-like spin splitting. Okay, so it's shown in this uh, picture here. Uh, we can have possibly also have a topological hinge state, or we can have a, a two-dimensional TI state, which uh, in this, even though we have uh, this actually fairly thick, uh, you know, multi-layers, uh, but this possibly each of those layers are effectively decoupled. So we're basically having a, a stack of two DTI states. Uh, so unfortunately, currently we actually from the data we cannot distinguish between all these different states. Uh, uh, but but I think I just want to say that each of the states are very interesting and uh, the interesting ones own right. And so each of this you can a certain we can find out which uh, which one of the states or perhaps even perhaps more than one of the states are responsible for the transport. I think this would be uh, extremely interesting. Uh, okay, so lastly, I want to sh want to show uh, that we are able to make a Josephson junction uh, out of this uh, device. So we couple the device. So this is again alpha bismuth iodide to niobium electrodes, which are superconducting. This will make us uh, make a Josephson junction. And so the graph uh, on the uh, top graph here plots the resistance as a function of gate voltage, and uh, the horizontal axis is a bias current current bias. So the uh, the dark blue area uh, so it shows the uh, it's a zero resistance state. Uh, okay, so this uh, um, uh, and so we can see that uh, okay. So and this uh, uh, right lines here I show uh, are the critical current. So we see that the critical current is uh, slightly tunable. Okay, so it's tunable by so it changes with k voltage, although the change the, the change is relatively small. But right now, nevertheless, it is uh, it is gate tunable. Um, so the uh, okay, so the graph down here is showing a line cut. Uh, so this is uh, uh, so I think line cut at probably minus sixty uh, gate voltage, um, and this uh, showing we have uh, uh, so this is so we have superconducting state. Um, so this uh, uh, red line just shows uh, the data taken at four point four Kelvin. This is above the uh, above the uh, superconducting uh, transition of for this uh, for this Joseph induction, um, and in the magnetic field, we can we can see that uh, this is plots the differential resistance as a function of critical current and uh, magnetic field, and which we see in a critical field uh, of actually fairly large uh, up to uh, uh, one point five Tesla. Uh, okay, so uh, so okay, so this is so that we can have a uh, gate tunable supercurrent, and so I, I also it can support possibly possibly support topological superconductivity. Okay, so just to uh, conclude this part of the talk, I want to say that uh, okay, so the future work we want to uh, as just ascertain the uh, the higher order topological hinge state uh, in this Bismuth iodide and Bismuth bromide samples. And also we heard yesterday uh, that uh, this uh, 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 this ternary compound, uh, this is bromide iodide, uh, can can be very interesting. So we'll be also be working on that. Uh, and uh, oh, I just so this you have seen this already. This is a SDM study of this topological hinge state uh, in, in the at step edge of this is bromide. And so we're uh, also working on the transport measurement. Uh, working towards the transport measurement, uh, uh, you uh, look for uh, uh, about on this. Okay, so uh, all right, so uh, let me uh, talk about the uh, go to the second topic, uh, which is the uh, superconductivity in the twisted bilayography. Uh, so this work is uh, a lab and my student Ivan Kim uh, using Zhang and Xu Shi Gao. And so it's a very uh, so a joint project uh, with uh, Mark Barcraft's group, my colleague Mark Barcraft. And the th so theoretical guidance and support are provided by my colleague Mohit Mo Randaria 
and also Fan Zhang. And of course, the uh, Tanaguchi group has provided the uh, uh, hexagonal Brown nitride. Okay, so this uh, work is uh, this motivated by this uh, simple question. Uh, is that, uh, so what happens when you think about what happens in the flat band? So we know what flat band is. The flat band is when you plot the this energy momentum dispersion. You, know, you have this graph here. The flat band just means that, okay, it, it becomes very flat. It eventually becomes, uh, it, it can, you know, in the limit of truly flat band is just the horizontal line, which means that uh, the potential energy, the velocity is very small, or in this case, zero. And potential energy is much larger than kinetic energy, and therefore the electronic interactions will dominate. But what happens when, in the case of a truly flat band, what happens when you have zero Fermi velocity? Uh, the question is, can we still have a conductor? How do you conduct? Your, how does the electron move? Right? How do you conduct current when the electrons does not do not move? Let, how do we have a superconductor uh, in this case? Uh, okay, so uh, so in the past, I think people have thought about this. A lot of times people just uh, kind of cop out by saying that, uh, oh, maybe uh, maybe you know, the band are not truly flat. It'll be, you know, the velocity is slow, but uh, not that slow, but okay, slow, but can still fast enough to conduct electricity. Okay, so, uh, okay, so the, in this case, okay, so we're going to see what happens when we have really, really small current. Okay, so the system we use is the twisted bilayer graphene. Uh, so we know that uh, when you put down, lay down two bilayer, two graphenes at small twist angle, uh, in particular uh, close to 1.05, uh, uh, so flat bands can form. And uh, so, this, so this is first predicted by Alan McDonald's group. Uh, in this deep distraction, uh, McDonald in 2011. And seven years later, the seminal work from Pablo Herrero Herrero's group and show that we, there is a correlated insulating state uh, and superconductivity uh, forms uh, can, are observed in the system. So this has now been the, one of the hottest system uh, in the uh, in the you know, field of uh, material physics, and uh, also now the twistronics uh, is uh, is uh, is a huge uh, is a huge frontier uh, right now. Okay, so here we the device we make is uh, this is a bioreactive device. Uh, it uh, from the peaks of the uh, full filling, we can estimate that the angle is at one point zero eight degrees. Uh, so we have a band insulator, and uh, when we have uh, this new is meaning number of uh, number of electrons per uh, super lighter cell. So we we'll have uh, this is global direct point. We we'll have a band insulator at uh, uh, we at the global direct point and also have four electrons or four holes per unit cell. And we have uh, also correlated insulating state when we have two holes per unit cell. The superconducting region is between minus two and 2.5, so it's right here. Okay, so um, uh, so the sample is uh, has very low resistance, so uh, it's in the ballistic regime. Uh, so another thing we want to uh, uh, I want to mention here, this is actually fairly important, uh, is that uh, we have this, uh, so in this, uh, you know, twisted bilayer graphene, where say something happens, so-called direct revival, or sometimes a direct recycling of the spectrum. Uh, it means that uh, every time you feel the, like one uh, uh, integer electrons in the super lighter cell, uh, the, the direct spectrum resets. Okay, so every, uh, so, so that, uh, uh, so you have uh, so this is some of the picture uh, from the previous uh, previous work, and so what well, here we're going to say that the, therefore the charge density is going to be measured uh, from the half filling point. That is a half filling point. I'm going to say this effective charge density is zero, and uh, everything we're going to measure is from this uh, uh, from the half filling point. Okay, so uh, so with this, we can look at some of the data. This is the you know, superconducting regime. Uh, so this is actually nothing. If, uh, this is all you know been reported before. This is so consistent with previous work. We see a superconducting dome here. We're plotting the resistance as a function of temperature, and again, this charge density. Um, so again, this half filling point is here, and this is our. Uh, so this is our. Um, uh, this is our char uh, zero uh, charge density, effective zero charge density. 
And so uh, we see this uh, um, zero resistance, which is this dark blue area. Okay, so we see the superconducting dome. And so at the top of the dome, we, this is what we call optimal doping. This is when we have the highest TC, the highest transition temperature. So here we're going to take 20% of the normal state resistance to be our criteria of superconducting. And that gave us 2.2 Kelvin. If we take 50%, like in uh, some of the pre uh, prior literature, uh, so 50% of the normal state resistance, this will give us three Kelvin uh, TC, which is this actually is among the highest uh, reported uh, TC in twisted bilayer bracket. Um, okay, so and then following the convention of the cuprits, we're going to say that to the left of this uh, uh, of this uh, optimal doping, we're going to so this has more charge, uh, uh, so more char uh, more dense charge density. I'm going to call it overdoped. And to the left, we're going to have less charge density than the optimal doping. I'm going to call it underdoped. Okay, so uh, all right. So then, the uh, similarly, we can measure the resistance as a function of magnetic field and density, and this gave us uh, uh, this will give us the uh, okay. We have a dome in the in the critical in the critical field. So from the critical field, we can uh, so this will give us basically the so-called upper critical field for type two superconductor, and this gave us a coherence length. Uh, so uh, given by this equation here, relating the flux quantum, this is flux quantum, and the upper critical field. So this will give us a, a coherence length ranging from uh, basically 60, at roughly at optimal doping, to say 150-ish, uh, uh, 160, uh, when it's, uh, <clears throat> uh, when, when, when it's uh, you know, either underdoped or uh, overdoped. Jenny, may I have a question yep. on the mm -hmm. uh, zero magnetic field data? So uh, to the left of the superconducting dome, mm -hmm. it looks like there is a additional resistive dome, right? This this one? Yeah, what is that one? Um, uh, I don't, well, I'm not sure if this is real. I think this, a lot of times this, uh, um, it can be somehow misleading just from the color scale. I think you may not be this it may not be a real uh, oh unless you're saying here uh okay so that I should say I, I I do not know okay that's fine yeah, thank you that's a good question yeah but so I'm not sure this is real but I think there is something this is probably real yeah okay mm -hmm. uh, okay so now we are going to uh okay so now we're going to look at the do the not look at a normal state. Um, so we have we uh, apply a um uh a, a magnetic field, so a small magnetic field 0.2 Tesla, so that is completely suppresses superconductivity. And then what we do is this a nonlinear transport. Uh, so which which means that we apply a current and then we measure the differential resistance, and then this uh, this 2D graph plots this as a function of this uh, differential resistance DVDI, as a function of this uh, current density here, this is nanometer per micron, uh, and the horizontal axis is again the effective charge density again measured from hard feeling, which is here. Okay, so now we can look at this. Oh, the, uh, the immediately you see that. Okay, so what happens is that there is this blue region, okay, which actually indicates a low resistance. And then we look at this color scale, we have this higher resistance state, which is uh, this kind of uh, uh, brown lip. Uh, and, and, and okay, so uh, so you take, take some line cuts. So these are the typical line cuts. So for example, if we look at this uh, uh, yellow one, uh, so we have a small resistance at, uh, um, uh, we have a small resistance at uh, small bias, and then resistance goes up uh, very quick, very sharply, reaching a point, uh, the peak, and then decreases again. Okay, and so that, uh, and then, and so this, uh, uh, this blue region, uh, sorry, this this brown region, is really uh, shows that the peak location in the DVDI. Okay, so this, uh, so this actually, if you look at this, actually, if 
uh, it almost looked like political terms in the superconducting regime. Uh, the, the, you know, so so uh, it's like, of course, we, we know that this, uh, uh, this resistance is not really zero, it's not really superconducting, uh, but it really looks, the shape really looks like a critical current. And then, uh, so, and this, uh, so we're going to call this the uh, lo uh, lo location of the peak to be the critical current in the normal state, JCN. And this, uh, we can just you know, trace this electric increase almost linearly away from high affinity, uh, from, from, this, uh, from this effectively zero density. And, uh, and if we increase the temperature, uh, so you would go up to about five Kelvin. And this, uh, um, uh, so this actually can almost completely disappear. So this DVDI just, you know, slightly nonlinear, but it's almost, kind of almost linear now, right? So not, not too much feature in this. Oh, so this tells us there's something happening here and that it has a very small energy scale. Right? So it goes away at about five Kelvin. So um, less than, let's say, uh, less than half a meaning less than one. Okay, so now we are going to uh, do the same measurement, uh, except we change the magnetic, uh, the, the magnetic field is zero, so that is now it's superconducts. Uh, so now we can see that, uh, okay, so actually this whole thing also almost looks the same, except okay, what's happening is that we have this dark blue region, which is really zero resistance state, as opposed to this blue region in the, uh, in the normal state, so it's light blue, well, lighter blue, which is low but non-zero. So basically high resistance of a few hundred ohms, you know, let's say 200 ohms here, but this is really truly zero. Um, and then, but what's striking is that uh, uh, in this superconducting region for extended range of the uh, gate voltage the, of, den of charge density, uh, the critical current is actually exactly the same as in the normal state. But you see that I'm going to set this uh, partly to uh, half transparent and, and we're going to just overlay one on top of another. Now we can see that, uh, okay, so that actually you can see this, this lip, uh, at least for this region, is actually almost, for this part, is actually almost exactly the same. And then, of course, now with the, uh, uh, and then uh, it does not continue, this one continues, goes into uh, this, uh, uh, goes into here, but uh, for the superconducting region, you can see there is another, uh, there's an uh, eventually crashes down, right? so the critical current goes like this. Okay, so we can just extract this, and we can here we are going to uh, put that uh, we are going to just uh, plot the critical current as a function of uh, charge density, and uh, so the blue is the uh, critical current in the uh, you know superconducting state, and the red the critical current in the uh, normal state. And uh, what we what we see is that uh, okay, so they are, again they are uh, this this two critical current. Is the same you know, for extended range uh, in this region, and eventually they do bifurcate. Okay, so now the question is, uh, what is this critical current like DVDI uh, curve in the normal state? Well, we do not uh, naively we should really do not expect that. Uh, and the second question is, why are the critical currents in a superconducting state and a normal state are the same for for this uh, underdog region? Okay, so we have a scratch our head for a while, um, and then uh, so it turn, turns. Uh, fortunately, then we came across uh, uh, this paper was first posted on the archive. Uh, so this is a uh, work done from uh, uh, Manchester group, which uh, they uh, they call auto equilibrium criticality in graphing super lattices. And so what they have seen this similar critical current like behavior in a graphing on HBN, a line with HBN super lattice, on uh, uh, twisted bilayer graphing, although their angle is quite far away from the magic angle, um, and also even on monolayer graphing. So, okay, so this is, um, the, so the explanation is given by this, uh, this paper, which recently appeared in Science, but I'm going to just go through the, uh, go through the, uh, uh, the uh, briefly go through the physics here. So, uh, okay, so what happened is that um, we can imagine uh, the direct cone is like the martini glass and we're filling, well, when we have some charge density, we're basically filling the martini glass. Okay, so, uh, so here we have some, uh, some wine here, which is our electrons, our holes. 
And uh, so at the uh, zero current, no current, then everything is level. So we just have a Martini glass sitting in stationary. Hey, Jenny, um, uh, a reminder yeah. of five minutes left. Oh, five minutes left. Okay. So, oh, I, I need to uh, hurry up then. Okay. So uh, if when we uh, apply a large current, or apply a current, which means that we're actually going to a siler, it's, it's like putting this martini glass on a moving frame. Uh, so the, so the, some of the liquid is going to slosh up the right wall. Uh, so a smaller current, when we can, then we can go to a larger current, larger and larger current, eventually all the liquid goes up uh, this wall. Um, okay, so the, uh, being the direct, so if you have parabolic glass, uh, then the current being the uh, proportion of the velocity, which is proportional to the slope. If you have parabolic glass, uh, the slope can almost keep increasing. So you will not run into any limit. But if we have a direct, uh, you have this direct spectrum. Uh, so the, all the, once all the charges reside on the right wall, then you cannot actually go uh, drive any more current, at least right, uh, at least very naively. You, you cannot drive any more current through because all the current, all the charges will have the same Fermi velocity right here. Um, okay, so now that then uh, this will this will you will we're going to hit this peak. Okay, so uh, once uh, uh, but okay, the, uh, but there's another mechanism that can come into play, which is so-called swinger mechanism which causes electron hole pair production and large electric field. So you would insist on driving more current through, uh, basically this, uh, the hole will start to conduct. And so, uh, and so then the current will, will decrease. Uh, so the DVDI, the differential resistance is gonna decrease. Okay, so this again has observed in the graphene HPN superlattices and graphene with constriction. Okay, so now with this, we can actually understand uh, what's happening in our data. Uh, which basically we have in the underdog region, we basically we have the critical current are the same in the normal state and the superconducting state. We suggest that they are limited by the same mechanism, uh, right? So, and independent whether they are normal or superconducting. Uh, so in this case, we, we, it is really explained by this Schrodinger mechanism, which is that basically we have a band velocity limiting how much uh, current uh, can be carried in the normal state or in a superconducting state. So this is actually gave us a new current limiting mechanism in a superconductor. Uh, in the overdope region, then actually there's a conventional um, condition, which is a so-called dependent condition, uh, starting to, uh, or start to take over. This is like when the critical uh, superfluid moves with velocity Vs, and, uh, and this will shift basically the Fermi level over. Uh, and if the shift of this Fermi of this Fermi uh, C H bar times K F times this uh, fluid uh, a superfluid velocity, when the shift is larger than superconducting gap, uh, then this uh, the uh, the superconductivity will be destroyed. So this is so-called deparent condition, and so we think this is happens when in the overdope region. Okay, so in this part we basically find a new uh, current limiting mechanism. In a direct superconductor. Okay, so now we have uh, with that we can actually. So the nice thing about this is that we can use this location to find the um, uh, to 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 calculate the Fermi velocity. So just a peak location to calculate Fermi velocity, saying that this location is uh, given by the charge density. Uh, the critical current is given by charge density times the electron from charge times the Fermi velocity. Uh, so this is extremely slow charges. We can see that the Fermi velocity will back out is about over, on the order of a thousand. This is actually really slow, right? This is factor of thousand smaller than the velocity in a um, in model layer graphene. Uh, okay, so now with this, now we can go back to look at this uh, BCS theory of superconductivity. So now it turns out like a lot of these parameters um, related to the Fermi velocity. Okay, or uh, in this case, the superfluid stiffness is related to the um, uh, one over effective mass, okay, which is in the flat band effective mass will be infinite. Okay, so I also just want to briefly say that superfluid stiffness, you can envision it as a kind of a spiral uh, because the superfluid stiffness uh, um, 
so so the current car uh, current carriage in by superconductor uh, is proportional to the gradient of the phase. So the phase you can envision a spiral. Super fluid stiffness is basically proportional magnetic constant. So stiffer is the spiral, the larger super fluid stiff stiffness, and better the superconductor is better. You can carry larger larger current. Okay, and so but if you put in all the numbers. Uh, we obtained this. We see that we say, we gave us a lot of ridiculous numbers. For example, the superconducting gap. Uh, we put in a Fermi velocity of a thousand, and this will give us a ratio between the gap and TC of about 0 0.05, and the BCS should be like 1.8, and it's even larger for unconventional superconductors. And the coherence length will give us 2.6. And superfluid stiffness is actually constrained. So TC also gave us a TC of point smaller than 0 0.01 Kelvin. So of course this uh, this is not what we see experimentally, right? So this is contrary of experimentally everything out by orders of magnitude. Uh, so okay, so what happens is that there is a, a quantum, so it was a final, uh, it was quantum geometry. Uh, this is again, this is basically a we can define a gauge invariant geometric tensor. And uh, so it measures the distance between quantum states and so kind of overlap of one of wave functions. And this uh, actually a resurgence of interest in the role in the flat band. Uh, so I would say first was uh, pointed out by Thomas group, basically back in 2015. This is even before the discovery of flat band superconductivity in twisted bilayer graphing. But now with the twisted bilayer graphing, I think there's actually a lot of interest in this, so there's a lot of theory papers. And uh, what we want to do is we want to uh, estimate the superfluid stiffness from data. And so I just do a simple estimate. For example, the um, equilibrium current is related to super uh, fluid and times the gradient of the phase. I say the gradient of phase is roughly given by one over the coherence length. And so from this, we can actually um, uh, estimate again, this is not exact, but I would say this is a uh, reasonable, uh, reasonable estimate of the superfluid stiffness uh, uh, for, for the data. And so the nice thing is that this is, in this is only depends on the critical current in a superconducting state and the coherence length uh, divided by flux quantum. So both of this uh, can be measured. And so this is what we measured here. Okay, this red graph here. And this blue graph, uh, sorry, the dotted line here is uh, uh, from, from the, um, oops, the dotted line is the conventional uh, measurement, the conventional uh, superfluid uh, stiffness, uh, which shows that it's actually much smaller. It's about 10%, contribute to about 10% of uh, what we measure experimentally. Um, so, okay, so what we uh, can see that is basically here in this superfluid stiffness is now no longer uh, set by the kinetic band energy, but, but by interaction energy, which is to be proportional to the superconducting gap. Okay, so uh, in this case, I think I might time this up. Maybe let me just very quickly saying that in this case, uh, we actually measure very large uh, ratio between T critical temperature and the Fermi temperature, which is very strange, it's actually greater than one. Okay, so uh, and this is indicate we have in this unprecedented regime and a crossover to the both Einstein condensation regime. Okay, so with this, uh, so let me just say, uh, so here are the main points we want to say, mainly is that in, the, in, a, uh, in this uh, derived superconductor, we have band velocity with limiting the current and uh, in twisted bilayer graph in terms of quantum geometry by our estimate, uh, contribute that uh, is uh, accounts for about 90% of the superfluid stiffness and the BCS equations will need to be re revisited. Okay, so thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks Jeannie. Um, questions, please unmute yourself. Um, may I have a quick question about uh, the critical current? Mm -hmm. uh, Professor, how do we uh, 
a separate the contribution of the superconducting one and the, the you know the Schringer mechanism one. Yeah, uh, this graph. So what what do you mean separate? Um, okay, so what we see is that in the you know in this region, right? This is approximately this is under the region. Uh, this basically the normal state and superconducting state have except, have the same critical current. Uh, so what we think happens is that so basically they are limited by the same mechanism, and uh, so what we, this will be the Schwinger mechanism, and then if, uh, and then in the overdub region they start to uh, uh, diverge right so they bifurcate and and so well so this happens here is the um, uh, so this is basically the deparent condition starting to take over. So basically we'll have two things that you can kill superconductivity in this direct superconductors. One is a swinger mechanism, which is a band elastic limited, and the other is a deparent mechanism. Uh, so uh, superconductivity, so whichever one can kill you first will kill, <laughs> kill you. <laughs> this is what, uh, so the, whichever one is, uh, you'll be killed by, uh, you know, whichever one can kill, kill the superconductivity first, it kills. So in this case, because the gap of the superconductor uh, decreases as uh, you know, the TC goes down, the gap decreases. So in this case, uh, the parent condition becomes a limiting in the overdose region. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ginny, I have a quick question yeah. on this, on this is the same figure. So uh -huh. the, the underdoped uh, region and the overdoped region, they do a lot of you know, uh, overlap. But why the uh, the blue curve and the red curve they overlap in the low density region? What do, what do you mean they don't overlap? Because uh, at different density, at higher density, uh, you will have this overdoped curve, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. the lower lower density, you know, you 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 should have the underdoped curve. Mm -hmm. But then you know, uh, from you know zero to uh, roughly two. Mm -hmm. You have both, you know, under the curve and the over the curve. Right? Uh, no, no, no. So this uh, red one is the uh, um, it's a critical current in the normal state, right? Oh, and normal the, state. Yeah, this is a normal state. And I see. So why is critical current in a superconducting state? I see. So basically, these two are the same. In that this is under -dope. And this region is over the. This I, I got you. I got you. So, so basically, the red red one is uh, uh is for normal normal state. The blue one yes. is for superconducting state. Yes. Yes. I see. I see. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, for the interest of time, maybe you should move to the next talk and uh, thank uh, Jenny again. All right. Thank you. So the next speaker will be Professor Barry Bartley from uh, UIUC. Um, Barry, can you share your screen?